happy. Happiness, well-being, quality of life, these are all points of defense against today's barrage of worldly hazards. I won't name them, you already know the list. You face them day in and day out. But for Pete's sakes, even the misery index is back. Maybe it makes sense that Americans venture outdoors less than 8% of their entire lives. And now researchers project that 20 to 30% of all workers will work at home permanently. What does this mean for the nation's psyche? I have one word, space. Not the Elon Musk kind of space. The space we all see and breathe and inhabit every day. The space called home. That's our business after all, and expectations for that space have never been higher. The space that we call home directly impacts our subconscious, contributes to our emotional state, shapes our perceptions. As such, interior design has a major influence on people's psychology, especially their emotional disposition. Interior spaces have big implications to happiness, well-being, and quality of life. What a task interior designers have in this brave new world. Today we speak with someone at the top of her game, Elizabeth Hagee, Senior Vice President of Multifamily Sales at Builders Design. Welcome to the show, Elizabeth. Thank you so much. Uh, first, I'd just like to thank you for inviting me on your program today. I mean, it's always a pleasure talking about my passion, and so I'm excited to be a guest. Thank you. It, it is wonderful to have you. What must we know about you and Builders Design? As you stated, yes, and my name is Elizabeth Hagee. I am a Senior Vice President, Multifamily Sales with Builders Design. Um, Builders Design is now in its 46th year. Um, it is a family owned and operated uh, company now in its second generation. With a national reach, Builders Design can facilitate multiple verticals such as uh, model homes, sales centers, multifamily, senior living. Um, and as a company, we operate as an innovative and entrepreneurial thinking firm, which encourages strong collaboration and creativity just amongst our team. As a company, our mission statement is to uh, interiors that perform passion, creativity, execution. And it's these virtues that really drive us together as a group. Um, for me, I joined Builders Design in 2006. So basically I was a baby. Um, I started as a senior designer focused uh, specifically on model homes um, with a desire to work on larger variety of projects and um, be more client facing. I, you know, with that in mind, I transitioned from that active design role into more of a business development and sales uh, 10 years ago. Eventually, following my passion to focus 100% of my energies on multifamily specifically. I am based in North Carolina, in case you haven't quite yet been able to pinpoint my accent, um, but manage a large portfolio nationally, which is comprised of new development, renovation, student housing, uh, of course now build for rent, and senior living. This mix of project type and geographical locations allows me an incredible opportunity to be able to tour and experience a variety of markets, which has broadened my knowledge and exposure overall with the multifamily industry. How has COVID affected your recommendations for design of interior space? Yeah, it's a great question. And it's one that I have gotten quite a bit over, you know, this post pandemic era, or we want it to be post pandemic, but you know, honestly, not much. Um, of course, there were many projects that were through design development when COVID arose and some that installed in the height of the pandemic, um, exceeding leasing expectations, mainly because we had already anticipated the increase and in demand for trends such as co-working and health and wellness. I don't believe the pandemic really created new trends, but rather rushed some that were already on the horizon. That being said, I do think some amenities such as hospitality counters and the coffee amenity will have changes post COVID. So how we will design to these will really be client and development specific. You know, a lot of people are still questioning how this changes post pandemic. And, you know, our company actually sent out a survey of, that over 700 people took 
um, you know, maybe about a year ago, but I think they were a little skewed, right? Because so many people were still scared. So many people maybe today are still scared. Um, and I think that it, that affects the way that people respond. Um, but I think just looking at the way people are living, and I think maybe I could have mentioned this, but, you know, I, I could be in North Carolina one day and Seattle the next day. And, and the bottom line is that these people are building community the same way. You know, they might have masks on and they might not, <laughs> but, um, you know, at the, at the crux of it. And I think, especially as an industry, nobody builds anything they want to touch for at least 10 years. So it's, I think it, I think all of the smart people were not having any knee jerk reactions about now the, the renovations kind of got put on hold for a bit, but <laughs> I think even those are coming back now that the expectations are so much higher. So. So are these changes long lasting or is it too soon to tell? You know, again, I, I don't really think that there's much that we see that changed rather just, you know, predictions that kind of sped up, you know, the standard hospitality counter or coffee station that I mentioned a few moments ago, um, it may be gone forever in some communities. Um, you know, management at some communities will, without a doubt, seize the opportunity to no longer mess with the daily hassle of monitoring the coffee station and certainly see a monthly expense savings, while other developers may believe in it and improve area offerings like that. And I'm sure that there are other amenities um, that would follow suit and be the same. Work from home is definitely a facet that's creating the need for versatility. What techniques do you use to make interior spaces more flexible? So, I mean, I think there's two things that we can talk about there. One is within the unit and one, of course, is in the in the common space. And I would say when we look at in the units, we're certainly trying to um, stage a model so that you can see that versatility and see how as a you know prospective resident, you can use that space, whether that's um, a nightstand on one side and a desk on the other, or trying to find that desk space in your common area. When we look at um, amenity spaces, um, there's a lot of different things here. Um, we're looking at private pods because there are people such as what we're doing right now that are having to capture some of their workday virtually that either have a roommate or just want the privacy of getting outside of their unit and a little bit of a different atmosphere. Um, there are people that want more collaborative space. So community tables are still being popular, um, even post COVID. And then looking at little pop-up stations. So I think function, and, and we'll certainly get into that as we continue our conversations, but I think function is gonna be key in, in allowing people to understand that there are multiple areas within your development where they can work. Some of your designers are trained on LEED standards. How does interior design feed into the LEED certification process? So, I mean, it does, it, it really doesn't change much. I mean, with the developments we are targeting, um, with clients that we know are targeting LEED specific certification, we're certainly specifying products that are LEED specific. Um, some even have lead coordination um, consultants, and we are providing them with the additional information they need so that they can get that certification. Um, but the process is otherwise similar to non-lead versus lead. When working on a lead certified project, how early do you get involved in the design process? Yeah, and this kind of goes to what we were just talking about, but the process involvement is typically the same, again, whether it's lead or non-lead. We are usually brought into a project during the early programming and preliminary vision phase and work closely with structural MEP to develop early design direction and interior adjacencies. And so this would be the same on a project that was LEED certified or non-LEED. Will LEED certification become a larger part of your business? Great question. <laughs> um, you know, I think we certainly have seen a continued increase in focus in health and wellness. Um, I think that post COVID consumers have certainly have a more heightened awareness. Um, and when we talk about things that are related to the building industry, um, they're looking for higher filtration systems, low VOC finishes, even circadian lighting, um, and certainly just the benefits of indoor and outdoor and how those two connect. 
So just to name a few, I think the influx from our business uh, will greatly depend on whether or not developers desire to incorporate some of those things um, or all of those things and, and seek that LEED certification. You are the ace of the base on trends, Elizabeth, specifically <laughs> demographics and amenities. What changes are ahead that our multifamily developers and operators should know? Um, don't, don't we all want to know that? Um, I mean, there's some secret to the sauce, but you know, not, not anything I think that isn't already on the realm. But what I will say is that, you know, globally post pandemic, we're looking at a population that's moving out of the urban settings and into more suburban. And that's a complete shift. Um, this change will lead to more economic diversity in suburban communities, which will result, I think, in higher expectations for amenity and common spaces in tier two locations. That said, I think we need to think as a group and as an industry beyond this live, work, play concept that we've you know, come to talk about for years now um, and think, of, think more about um, individuals as well as, um, or in addition to individuals, also their, their children and their pets. You know, how are we using a variety of amenities to create uh, community? You know, I think that is how it's gonna be important. Um, certainly health and wellness is on the forefront of everyone's minds when we talk about amenities, but you know, that's whether you're offering spa amenities or whether or not you're just looking at that interior exterior con connection or adding living walls or things like that. Overall residents are looking for space within their units as well as common areas where they can engage their hobbies their pastimes, their passions, and, and still entertain and feel that sense of community. So I think if you're approaching a development, um, whether it's new construction or renovation, with those things in mind about how do you reinforce that community, um, that's what people are, are looking for, that, that genuine sense that it was well thought out. Speaking of what people are looking for, do you see strong regional differences in those preferences? Are our other differences like urban, suburban, rural more important in determining those preferences? Yeah, I really don't. Um, although I did mention the shift from urban to suburban, you know, a few moments ago, it was more the expectation of suburban amenities uh, being much higher than in previous years. Um, when we start a project, you know, kind of like I just mentioned, it's not. Um, it's not really about the geographical location as much as the demographic that we're catering to. Um, we want to understand the resident demographic and sometimes, you know, who were even in, in um, renovation, that could be who lives here versus who we want to capture, who are we not capturing, right? That can go into the conversation as well. And so we want to make sure that we're designing a space that speaks to that demographic that they can utilize um, and that is functional for them. There's absolutely nothing better um, in my job than revisiting a property that we had some part in shaping um, and seeing those residents interact with that space and even better inviting their you know, friends, coworkers to, to lease up here because they're finding so much function within this space. So um, that says that you're doing it right right? You're, you're creating that sense of community and they not only want to live there, they want to continue to live there and continue to, to build that community that you've given them a space to develop. Elizabeth, fascinating show. Thank you for sharing your insights. Of course. Thank you for having me. The spaces we occupy directly affect our behavior. Light, color, configuration, scale, acoustics, materials, all impact an individual and generate a spectrum of feelings and action. Housing has long reflected social needs and trends. Once the industrial revolution shaped our spaces, today well-being has taken the lead. Through it all, we can count on top experts like Elizabeth to translate social need to livable space. Thank you for being with us today. Builders, developers, operators, you are what make this nation great. Housing stabilizes a society. It's primary to all other success. I'm Linda Hoffman. Look for our next exciting episode of NAHB Power Hitters.